ETA Hoffman's The Nutcracker, an enchanting pop-up adaptation. Everything about Christmas Eve was good. The sights, the sounds, the smells. It was a wonderland of delight. And it all lay just beyond the keyhole Marie and Fritz took turns peeping through. The smells of spruce tree and puff pastry drifted past the threshold. The sounds of the orchestra sneaked through the hinges. Glimpses of swirling silk gowns and shiny brass buttons and tables covered with gifts and treats made the children bounce on their toes. And behind everything, there was the great towering tree, festooned with ribbons and baubles and apples and 300 shimmering candles. Just when the children thought they couldn't stand to wait another moment, the doors swung open. Fritz darted into the ballroom, heading straight for a table piled with gifts. Marie hesitated, savouring the music and the glorious sight of the party, then joined her brother. Their godfather, Judge Drosselmeyer, towered over his gifts, including a clockwork castle with tiny moving figures and an army of horses and soldiers, which Fritz grabbed up and set into battle formations. Again, Marie hesitated, eyes searching the table. Godfather Drosselmeyer smiled at her mysteriously, then reached inside his cloak and drew out a curious wooden doll. The doll was smartly dressed, with buttons and trim much like that found on the jackets of the men dancing around them. He had a domed cap and glossy boots, and his hair curved round his face, which held a curious expression. A wide-eyed, pleading grin that Marie felt immediate sympathy for. Judge Drosselmeyer reached into his cloak again, and this time pulled out a walnut. He placed the nut in the doll's teeth, then pulled a lever at its back, and crack! The walnut split into two perfect halves. Marie was entranced. She reached for the nutcracker and hugged it to her heart. Fritz soon caught sight of the nutcracker and insisted on a turn with him. He ran for the treats table and dug out the largest nut in the dish, a giant black nut with a shell like stone. He wrenched the nutcracker open, shoved the nut in and slammed the wooden jaw shut. Crack! But this time, it wasn't the sound of the nut cracking open. This time, it was the sound of splintered wood. The nutcracker's jaw had broken. Marie flew to the toy, scooped him out of Fritz's hands and tucked herself into a quiet corner behind the boughs of the Christmas tree. She pulled a ribbon from one of the gifts and tenderly bandaged the nutcracker's broken jaw. She rocked him in her arms and sang bits of nursery rhymes and lullabies until eventually she herself fell asleep under the tree. Marie's dreams were stormy and strange. She saw two queens, one human and the other a mouse, arguing bitterly. She saw a beautiful baby turned into a goggle-headed creature. She saw a young man turn a grown-up goggle-headed creature into a lovely lady and saw that same young man, so like her nutcracker, bowing before the lovely lady, then stumbling as he stepped back. And then the young man was her nutcracker. The fine lady's face turned stony with disgust and she shooed him away from her. Marie woke to the sound of the clock chiming midnight and a chorus of curious tiny squeaking sounds. The party had ended. All the guests were gone. Instead, the room was filled with a motley collection of toys and mice, all in fighting formation. Fritz's soldiers had mounted their horses and fallen into ranks. 
The Nutcracker, her Nutcracker, was positioned at the front of the toy battalion. Together, they faced an enormous army of skittering, squeaking mice with a fearsome seven-headed mouse king in command. For a moment, the two armies stood their ground. Then, the Mouse King squealed his attack, and everything was a whirlwind of motion. The battle that followed was legendary. There were losses on both sides, but the toy army was badly outnumbered and was soon overcome. The Nutcracker fought to the end, but even he could not subdue the rodent hordes. The Mouse King descended upon him. Marie, terrified for her magical toy, yanked off one of her shoes and threw it with all her might at the Mouse King. The slipper spun through the air for what seemed like hours, then hit the Mouse King with such force, all seven of his crowns flew into the air, and poof, just like that, it was over. The Mouse King was vanquished, and his troops scampered a retreat to every corner and hole. What a cheer arose in the ballroom that night. The Nutcracker reached his hand to Marie, and taking it, she found she was suddenly not even as tall as he was. The tables and chairs were like mountains and cliffs around them, and the dolls smiled down at her. The soldiers marched into two lines and made an arch of their swords, and the Nutcracker led her deep under the boughs of the Christmas tree. For several minutes, they walked as if through a forest. Eventually, they passed the tree's mighty trunk, and as they did, it began to snow, soft flakes drifting and dancing around them. After some time, they heard the gentle lapping of water, and around a bend in the path, they came upon a small river running past. A swan-shaped boat glowed like a pearl on the water. The Nutcracker lifted Marie in, then climbed in next to her. They drifted past many lands on their journey that night, each more extraordinary than the last. Marie looked on it all with delight, but most of all, she looked at the figure beside her with his enormous head, wooden sword and wide-eyed grin. To others, he may have looked comical, but to Marie, he was only her dear, wondrous friend. Long into their journey down the river, their boat came to rest on a shimmering shore. There they were greeted by a winged host, the Sugar Plum Fairy. She welcomed them warmly to her kingdom and led them to her palace. Inside, a wondrous hall with soaring gilded ceilings and polished stone floors stretched out in front of them. Two golden chairs were placed there, perfectly positioned to watch a grand dance performed in their honour. One group after another, the dancers performed. First, a Spanish matador and maid in ruffled sleeves arched a festive duet, followed by a trio of Arabian dancers in silk pantaloons and jewels who mesmerised Marie with their curving and whirling. Next, Four Chinese dancers stepped and leapt across the floor and back again, balancing stacks of teetering teacups and twirling and tossing their parasols to dizzying heights. Then the Russian dancers swirled in, kicking and spinning so quickly they blurred before Marie's eyes. There was a pause in the dancing and the spectators all craned to see who would be next to perform. Slowly, from behind a heavy tapestry curtain, Mother Ginger appeared with her enormous hair, thick with icing and with skirts as wide as a carriage. She made her way across the floor and curtsied to Marie and the Nutcracker, who nodded their approval. Mother Ginger smiled and clapped her hands and one by one, a line of gingerbread girls and boys tiptoed out from her skirts and pirouetted round the floor. Finally, the sugar plum fairy took the floor. Flowers streamed into the hall and clustered around her in a perfect bouquet. All was quiet. 
Then, the sound of a distant music box drifted in. The fairy began to dance. She floated in front of them, spinning shapes in the air, and the flowers wove patterns around her. The air around her shimmered with magic, and the nutcracker took Marie's hand and held it tightly. In an evening filled with lovely things, this was the loveliest of all. Marie turned to the nutcracker and whispered, You are more dear to me than anything. The air continued to shimmer and sparkle, and Marie looked with wonder all around her, and then at her beloved nutcracker, who shimmered so hard she blinked, then blinked faster and faster and faster. Blinking, Marie woke up to sun streaming through the tall windows of the ballroom, right into her eyes. She was still in her corner, behind the boughs of the tree. She'd slept there all night. Marie glanced up and was startled to see Godfather Drosselmeyer looking down at her with a laughing grin. He had just arrived and was in his hat and cloak. He winked at her, then stepped aside to reveal another person looking down upon her. Marie's breath caught. How could it be true? It was the young man from her dream, the one so like her nutcracker. But he was real and smiling shyly at her. Godfather Drosselmeyer's eyes twinkled as he introduced the young man, his nephew from a distant land down a long and winding river. Marie hesitated for a moment, then laughing flew up and hugged the boy fiercely. She was so happy to see her dear friend come to life. In the years that followed, Marie and the young man became inseparable and grew up to meet all sorts of curious people. They explored kingdoms and forests and oceans and mountains. In fact, they had every adventure imaginable in that mysterious distant land down the long and winding river. But that's a story for another time. Join us at books.com or download the app.